So we're still kind of continuing here. Where we talk talking about uh, ways to describe a function. So we've talked about domain and range. We talked about positive, negative, zero. And we've talked about increasing, decreasing, and constant. We did all of that previously. Today, we're going to start by talking about something called extrema. That's going to be the, where we're going to start today new. So for extrema, there's two types. We can have maximums but that's not proper grammar. The plural for maximum is maxima. Now, I wouldn't mark anything wrong, and I'll probably say maximums at some point today, unintentionally, but the plural is actually maxima. Just trying to get you some grammar in your math class here. And then, as you might have guessed, the other one is a minimum, or the plural minima, If we talk about maxima and minima, there's really two kinds each of those. You can have a local maximum or minimum, or you can have a global or absolute maximum or minimum. We use the terms global and absolute kind of interchangeably in that context. Everybody okay so far? I haven't described what these things look like. Um, and again, I'm going to skip like a super technical definition for this because for this class, all I really want you guys to be able to do is to be able to identify them on the graph and kind of describe them using an interval. We're not going to do any proof with this, so we don't really need the technical definition. We just need to be able to see it when we see it and be able to talk about it. Um, so we're going to just look at a picture and use that as kind of our example on how to define some of these things. So let's say we have a graph that looks kind of like this. So a maximum is just the top of a hill. And a minimum is like the bottom of a valley. If I look at this, how many... Um, how many maximum, or how many maxima do I see? If I look at the example here. Top of the hill, one, right here. How many minima do I see? Two. Bottom of valley, bottom of a valley. Everybody okay there? So a local maximum or minimum, really any maximum or minimum is a local. For a global maximum, it has to be the highest point, and the global minimum has to be the lowest point.
So we said that we had one maximum and two minimums. Or minima, excuse me. Told you I was going to do it. It's hard not to. We really want to put that S at the end of it. Um, so let's do the minima first. So starting on the left, that minima, minimum on the left, is that local or global? This is a local, right? That's definitely not the lowest point on the graph, so it's just a local. If I look at the minima or minimum on the right, is that local or global? Global. That is the lowest point on our graph. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Let's look at the maximum. Is that local or global? It's just local. Why is it not global? Because there are lots of points higher than that. Notice that in the definition here I say highest point, not highest maximum. So we have to be careful for the, looking at those arrows and what they're doing at the end of the graph. Grace. So the global is the highest or lowest point. So the global maximum is the highest point. The global minimum is the lowest point. For this, because we have arrows going to up forever, there is no global maximum because there is no actual highest point on the graph because you pick a point and there's always another one after it because the arrow going up. So we have just a local maximum here. Um, any max or min is local. It's special if it also happens to be the global. So like this minimum down here, there's nothing low, there's no points lower than that. That's a global minimum. Uh, Jacob. Let, let, let me... Let me help out and draw a picture so everybody else can kind of see what you're asking about. So you're saying if we had, you know, something like this, right? So if it doesn't go on forever, this is still a minimum, this is still a minimum, this is still local, this is still global, this is a max, technically these are also maxes. So, not really a situation that I would worry about for you guys in this class, but yes, technically that is correct. And in this case, we have a local, a local, and a global. But good question. Does that feel better about the local, global stuff? Okay. And you feel okay identifying maxes and mins? This is usually pretty intuitive for students. They usually don't have a, too tough of a time with this. Um, worth mentioning, let's say we have a graph that looks like this. What can we say about the global maxes and mins in this graph? There aren't any, right? Now certainly we have locals, but the arrow pointing down eliminates the possibility of having a global minimum, and the arrow pointing up eliminates the possibility of having a global maximum. So oftentimes, right away, if you look at the arrows at the end of the graph, you can say something about the global max or mins, right? If I have two arrows pointing up, can't have a global maximum. Could have a global minimum. If I have two arrows pointing down, could have a global maximum, no global minimum. Everybody kind of get the idea there? Um, what if we're given an equation like this, and I asked you to find the max, 
or the extrema there, the maxes and mins. What would you do? This is a problem in this course we'll do completely and utterly on our calculator. So if you have your graphing calculator with you, I'd invite you to take that out. We'll start by turning our calculator on. So you notice the on button is located here in the lower left-hand corner of your calculator. When you turn your calculator on, you should see the home screen is probably blank unless you've been using it recently and then it might have some of the last things you typed in. And you have a cursor flashing on it indicating that's where, if you started typing, that's where it would start typing. Everybody managed to get their calculator turned on that has one out and it's following along? Okay. Um, our goal to find these max and min is going to be using the graphing function of this graphing calculator. To graph something, I want to go to the Y equals menu. So you notice the Y equals button is the <coughs> upper left-hand button here. So let's go ahead and press the Y equals button. When you press that, it's going to open the Y equals menu. And you'll notice here there are some features. So up at the top it says plot 1, plot 2, plot 3. None of those should be highlighted. When I say highlighted, it would look like this. If, you're, if you have a plot 1, 2, or 3 that is highlighted, use your up and down, left and right arrows to move to that highlighted part and press Enter so it is no longer highlighted. So your plot 1, 2, and 3 should look like this. We'll talk about what those do much later on. Right now they should all be off. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I notice that the y equals part is already built into my calculator. So what I'm going to do is type in the x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5x minus 3. The X button is located to the right of the alpha button, which is the green one on your calculator. So if I press the X button, you'll see I get an X. Everybody managed to find the X button? Okay. To do an exponent, what I'm going to do is this caret up button right here, located like two below the down arrow. When I press that button, it moves my cursor up into the exponent. And then I can just type the number 3. Notice when I do that, my cursor is still in the exponent, but it has like a right arrow on it. So everybody got the 3 typed in. What that's telling me is to move my cursor out of the exponent and back into the main line, I need to press that right arrow. So let's go ahead and do that. And you notice now my cursor is back on the main level as everything else. It's no longer in the superscript. So now I'm going to type the subtraction symbol, which is right on the right-hand side there in gray. And then I'll type the 3 and then the X button again. And to type the squared, I could do the exponent thing that I did before. But if you notice, the 3 down from the blue second command is an x squared button. I can press that and it'll just put in the exponent 2. It saves me some keystrokes. You could certainly do caret up 
type the number 2, and then press the over key. But that's like four keystrokes versus one keystroke. I'm lazy. I'll do the one keystroke. And then we'll finish this up by pr pressing the plus sign, the 5, X, and then the minus sign, and then the number 3. Um, I should probably say subtraction, because notice the calculator has a subtraction symbol here in gray and a minus sign here in white. Those two cannot be used interchangeably. So you have to use the minus when you mean minus and subtraction when you mean subtraction. Everybody okay with that? Maybe I should say negative sign instead of minus, but hopefully you got what I meant there. Everybody good with getting this typed in? Is anybody still struggling to get this typed in? Okay, to graph this thing, I think the best way for us to learn initially is to press the zoom button, which is located two to the right of the y equals on the home row. So that row at the top, three over is the zoom button. Go ahead and press the zoom button. You'll open up a menu that looks like this. And we have a bunch of different zoom options. The zoom that you guys want to pick is the zoom standard. Throughout the course, the majority of the time, zoom standard will be the one that you pick. So that's command six. You can scroll down with the up and down arrows to six and press enter, or you could just type the number six and it'll select that command for you. Ugh, I picked a bad function. So if I look at this, do we have any um, maximums or minimums? No, right? Why did this happen? Because I'm stupid and I picked a bad function that didn't have any. So that's my mistake. Let's do a different one. This one I promise will work because I checked this one earlier. But that's okay, because it was good practice, right? We learned where to put things in to graph things. We learned how to type equations in. We learned how to do the zooms to graph something. So if I want to type this one in instead, where do I go? Y equals. I'm going to get rid of this stuff. I'm just going to press the clear button, and that will wipe everything off of that line that was in. And then I'll just type this in exactly as it's written. So I'll use the caret up to get my exponents for the to the fourth and to the third. I'll use the shortcut for the x squared. You don't need to use the shortcut though. And then the negative three or minus three x, and then the plus one. Ooh. So again, what I typed in was just this. In your calculator, it should look exactly the same. Notice that it scrolls over and this particular thing is too long to even see the whole thing at one time, so you can only look at part of it because it's a long one. But it needs to be long in order to get like some doodly-doos in there that we can find max and min by. Everybody okay so far? Anybody still struggling to get this typed in? Okay, let's do the zoom standard. So I'll press the zoom button, and I'm going to use the shortcut and just press the number 6. So if I look at that, I notice I have a minimum, a maximum, and another minimum. Everybody agree with that? What if I was concerned with the actual point where the minimum, the max, or those mins and maxes are? The calculator can find this for us. Okay? So let's say, let's look for this first minimum first. So you see where my arrow is pointing at? That's the one we're going to look for first. For the calculator to find this, we're going to press the second button and the trace command. So the trace button is on that top row. It's the fourth one over. This opens up 
the actions that you can do to a graph. So all the commands here in this menu we can do to a graph. Which command does it look like the one that we'd be interested in? If you're just to take a guess. Minimum. We're looking for a minimum. We're going to use the minimum command. Everybody see that? So you can select that command by scrolling down to the minimum and pressing enter, or you can just type the number three. So now it, the calculator takes us back to the main screen, but it's asking us a question here at the bottom of the screen. Does everybody see the question here? It says left bound with a question mark. Everybody see that? What the calculator is going to ask us is, Give me where to look for this minimum. Tell me the where on the where to start, that's the left bound, and where to end, that's the right bound. Okay with that idea? So you'll notice if you look carefully where, where my arrow is at, there's a cursor flashing on your screen. So what I need to do is I need to move that cursor so it's over here somewhere on the left hand side of that minimum. So I'm just going to use the left arrow and keep pressing that until that cursor is somewhere, anywhere, on the left side of that minimum. So that looks good to me, right? That's definitely left of that minimum I care about. Everybody agree with that? Once I've got the cursor where I want it, I'm going to press Enter. Look at the bottom of the screen now. Notice the question has changed. It's now asking for a right bound. So I'm going to now move my cursor to the right of that minimum. Really anything over here would be okay. So I'm going to just press the right arrow key until that cursor is somewhere over here. That looks good. I'll press enter again. And now it's asking me a third question. It says guess. Here's the thing about the guesses. They don't really matter. So the same place your cursor was at before is a fine guess to start with. You could waste your time and move the cursor down to where you think it's actually at. But it's not going to make it really go any appreciably faster. It's like you're talking about microseconds faster with the guess, with a good guess versus some guess. The only rule is that guess has to be in between the two values you pick for the boundaries. So at the bottom of the calculator, you notice it says minimum. And then it says negative 2.24, yada, yada, yada for x and negative 6.5, yada, yada for y. So from looking at our graph and using that minimum command, I know the global minimum is the point negative 2.24, negative 9.65. And I know that was the global because I could tell that just from looking at my picture. Everybody's okay with that? Will you guys try to find on your own here right quick the maximum value, that maximum value on the graph? So repeat what we just did. I assume you knew which would know which command to use to find the maximum. It's kind of a trick question, right? Which command is it? Maximum. Where's that command located? Second trace. So the second button is the blue button, and then you press the trace. So in the second command, you see the blue commands over top many of the buttons here. To access those blue commands, you press the second button and then that button. Likewise, any of the green commands over any of these buttons, you press the alpha button and then that button to get the green command. That's how the calculator kind of works. Okay. So second trace, maximum, left bound, that looks good. Right bound, that looks good. Guess, sounds good. So there's your minimum, or I'm sorry, maximum. Uh, real Andrew, of course. 
So this one is just a local maximum. So it's about negative 0.32 comma 1.50. Do we feel okay on using our calculator to find these <coughs> maxes and minimums? Pretty easy, right? You just have to type the thing in, look at the graph to tell whether they're local or global, and then use the minimum or maximum command appropriately, and the calculator just tells you what the point is. Pretty, pretty easy, right? That's good. Okay. Everybody happy with this? Okay. Um, if you didn't have your graphing calculator with you today, my suggestion is when you do the homework and I ask you to do this, I'd queue up the video and just look at the video once more when you go through trying to find these maxes and mins. Or if you were here and got to practice on your own calculator and you forgot, queue up the video and watch my narration of how to do it because it's not terribly difficult but I get it you forget you watch it and you're like I got it get home pull your calculator out I don't got it you know I get it it happens no biggie beauty of recording these things right okay so that's kind of that about the extrema next thing to talk about is called end behavior What end behavior is, is just the description of what the arrows at the end of our graph are doing. It's literally how the ends of the graph are behaving. The name literally describes to you what this is. So let's say we have a graph that looks like this. So if I wanted to talk about what this left arrow is doing, I would say the left arrow points up. Everybody agree that that's a good description of what's going on? And then if I looked at this arrow and wanted to describe what it was doing, I might say the right arrow points down. Everybody happy with that? Here's the thing. Yes. Doing? Yep. <coughs> Here's the thing. That was so that was too easy, right? Do you, it is that easy. The only way it's going to become more complicated is the notation we're going to use to describe this. Because we're not going to describe end behavior in words. We're going to use some symbols. Okay? So when we say left, what we're saying as x approaches negative infinity. And maybe I should probably say as, as x approaches negative infinity. So this is really the same thing as saying the left arrow then we say y approaches positive infinity that's really the same thing as saying it points up because negative infinity lives on this part of the x that's the way the arrow is pointing Positive infinity lives on that part of the y, and that's the other direction the arrow is pointing. Does 
Everybody okay with that idea? So on the x-axis, the arrow is pointing to negative infinity. On the y-axis, the arrow is pointing to positive infinity. This is as bad as it gets. So that's not still not so bad, right? Because at least the notation makes sense in terms of exactly what it's saying exactly what we're saying. So for this one, my arrow is pointing to the right. So that's on the x's, that's going towards positive infinity. And it's pointing down, which for the y's is going to negative infinity. Everybody okay there? Let's take a look at this one. So this is a little mean because how many arrows do we see on this one? I see four. Um, and I need to give you a little bit more information here. Let's do, say that, and that. All right, so let's start with this arrow. This is the left arrow, correct? So we have x approaching negative infinity. Oops. Yes. And then y is approaching, this arrow is pointing kind of horizontally, right? <laughs> Everybody can kind of see that? Instead of pointing up or down, it's basically pointing horizontally. What y value does it look like it's going towards? Kind of looks like 2, right? If I track this across, that basically looks like what the horizontal line is following. You agree with that? Let's take this one now. So this arrow is pointing down. So that's y going to negative infinity. But it's basically pointing vertically down, right? What is the x value that it's kind of like following along there? Looks like negative 3, right? We look at this arrow, the y is, or the arrow is pointing vertically up, so that's y going to positive infinity. And here it also looks like the x going to negative 3. So we should somehow differentiate this because we have x going to negative 3 doing two different things, right? So one of them, we want to say, when we approach it from the left, when we approach negative 3 from the left, the arrow goes down. When we approach negative 3 from the right, the arrow goes up. Everybody okay with that idea? So this is from the left. The x values from the left are smaller than negative 3. This is the right end. The x values from the right are bigger than negative 3. So that's the way we kind of indicate which end of that we're talking about or which direction we're talking about.
And then we have one more arrow here at the end. This says that as x approaches positive infinity, because it's pointing straight to the right, y approaches, and then we do the same thing here, it looks like 2. Is everybody okay with the notation that we're using to describe the arrows? Um, in general, the notation, while initially you look at that and you're like, huh? When we start with describing it in words and then show what the symbols are saying in words, that usually that goes much better like what we did today, where the description in words is pretty usually pretty obvious, and then when you show what the symbols mean, or translating from the words to symbols, it's like, oh, okay, that's not so bad. Um, and I'll try to do that as much as I can, where we start with English and then turn it into mathematics, rather than show you the mathematics and try to turn it into English. That usually tends to go a little bit better for students. Okay, we'll stop.